wanted to start off with you. Uh, you've been pushing a long time for the repeal of the Cadillac tax. Right. Uh, you finally went through overwhelmingly in the House. So one of what if you could provide us an update of where it the prospects of it being taken up by the Senate and what might happen there. And also, if you won't give you a chance to respond editorially, we yeah. expressed our concerns. Right about taking apart one more part of Obamacare, which right. is kind of slowly being sort of chopped up in our, uh, to our concern. And, you know, we had other concerns. The one intent of it was to try to drive down health care costs uh, and uh, and also we're concerned about the, the revenue loss that, that, that would result. So we wanted to right. kind of two things. What if you give us an update and also wanted to provide you the opportunity to respond to some of the sure. things we had to say. So, again, the bill uh, is a very surgical uh, change to the Affordable Care Act, which um, is 441 sections when it initially passed. This was a section of a section. Okay, so in my opinion, as I said on the floor, um, you know the basic architecture of the Affordable Care Act is standing strong, um, w- even with enactment of this bill. Um, you know all the patient protections. You know eliminating pre-existing condition exclusions, uh, elimination of lifetime limits, uh, the uh, Subsidies for uh, insurance, the Medicaid uh, expansion. Uh, again, you know the the real stuff that actually is in effect today um, is completely unaffected if that law passes. Again, when it was adopted in 2010, it was a late add-on uh, to the bill. It was not part of the House bill when it left the House in the fall of 2009. I remember this stuff like it's yesterday, and um, it was uh, added in the Senate when they stripped the public option, which in retrospect I think was a terrible mistake. Um, I think, the, frankly, the ACA would be in even stronger uh, place today if uh, they had uh, gone, that, gone that route. Uh, and also, frankly, it also helped the, the budget score. Uh, and I know intuitively that may seem um, like it doesn't make sense, but in fact, the public option would have uh, reduced uh, the cost of the Affordable Care Act. And we also had a progressive tax pay for that was in the House bill when it went up to the Senate. So anyway, the Cadillac tax came back, 40 percent excise tax <clears throat> on the value of health plans calculated by premium. Uh, again, one size fits all across the country made no accommodation for the fact that there are, you know, vastly different reasons why premiums are constructed and the American College of Actuaries weighed in immediately saying this is a mistake um, because you're going to punish health plans that are in high cost uh, geographic regions like the Northeast and California. And um, uh, it also uh, for, uh, you know, large ERISA plans, which uh, basically calculate their premium costs uh, based on uh, factors like age and gender. Uh, the risk of the occupation, you know, people who work with their, you know, physical labor, um, you know, would be uh, much more uh, impacted by the Cadillac tax than, than uh, you know, workforces that that uh, look a little bit differently. So there was a big pushback. Um, we uh, organized a letter after it came back from the Senate. Uh, I, rem- again, remember vividly because I wrote that letter and we had 188 co-signers uh, that the speaker took to the White House when they were negotiating with uh, the Obama team. Uh, the effective date of the tax when it came down from the Senate was 2013. It got pushed back to 2018 and there's been two extensions since. So actually the effective date of the Cadillac tax is 2022 if you look at the tax code today. So it has not collected a single penny of revenue um, since it was added on by the Senate. And um, in my opinion, you know, it, it, not getting rid of it does not mean that it's going to go into effect because I, I think, you know, as the reality of the, the 2022 uh, effective date kicks in, Congress will do it again. I mean, we did this with the, the doc fix. Some of you may recall that was a, in the Medicare law back in the late 90s and early 2000s. Um, that was a across the board cut to the Medicare program um, that the, the Republican Medicare uh, bill put in in the, in the late 1990s. Um, and every time it came closer to the date of impact, uh, we kicked the can down the road for 17 years until the doc fix was passed and it just got deleted. Um, so, you know, what I, what I would note is, is that, um, you know, over time, as the reality of the impact was sort of understood better, by um, you know, people on the employer side, the American Benefits Council um, recognized that you know again this would have just a, a very unfair uh, impact in terms of what um, you know work uh, employment sponsored insurance plans would be impacted by it. They have been you know just militantly uh, lobbying to to get rid of it. Um, 
you know, obviously labor, you know, the unions who have negotiated um, health benefits and given up wage increases for decades uh, would have been adversely affected. So, you know, there is just uniform support uh, across the labor movement. Some, um, you know, unions like the metal trades uh, here in this region, firefighters, police unions, all, again, they, they've looked at this thing. They've actually been in negotiations on, on health plans as we were getting closer to the effective date. And, and they all concluded the same thing. The only way you avoid the tax is to just keep pushing people into higher deductible, higher copay health plans. That's how you would reduce the value of the health plan to avoid the tax. And, and again, when the economists who support the Cadillac tax are honest, they know, they agree. I mean, that, that this thing does not bend the cost curve by you know better efficiency in the delivery of health care. It just, it's just a blunt instrument um, that pushes people into higher and higher deductible plans. Since 2010, what we're seeing, and Kaiser Family has done a lot of analysis on this, and I think you guys know this probably at the day and other you know workplaces, higher deductible health plans are happening <laughs> at mock speed anyway, and this thing would have accelerated that um, even further. And, and that's why what was interesting over the last couple of years is patient advocacy groups that supported the Affordable Care Act, like the American Cancer Society, Families USA, they came out against the the Cadillac tax because they realized, you know, we're, we're getting into a place right now where people are underinsured in, with employment-based plans, and we're seeing problems with, with um, folks, particularly more lower-income working people who, as they're confronted with higher and higher deductibles, are, are avoiding emergency room care, primary care, and um, and so they came out for this. And again, they were these are staunch supporters of the Affordable Care Act. I mean, the American Cancer Society, you know, was for the ACA and still is to this day, as well as Families USA. They, they, Families USA, if you really want to get into it, wrote a piece for Health Affairs, uh, which is a you know highly respected medical journal. Uh, about three or four weeks ago, uh, where they called it the zombie tax, because uh, it's still rattling around in the tax code, has never gone into effect, but it still has a negative sort of overhang in terms of just the whole area there. So, um, so anyway, you know, as we got closer this year, 368, I think it is, co-sponsors, you know, very bipartisan, because again, just the, the input was so overwhelming. Um, we, we got a floor vote because we have the new 290 rule, which was part of the House rules that were adopted last January. If a bill has 290 co-sponsors or more, the, the Speaker's office has to put it on what's called the consensus calendar and allow an up or down vote. And we blew past that, um, obviously, the 290. Number 290, by the way, was uh, Congressman Richie Neal from Massachusetts, who's the chairman of the Ways and Means Committee, which is the committee that would deal with a tax issue like that. So that spoke very powerfully about the fact that this thing really um, has kind of been signed off by uh, and vetted uh, by the, you know, the congressional committee staff. And um, and obviously the vote was overwhelming, 419 to 6, you know, when the vote came up on the floor. So in the Senate, uh, Senator Martin Heinrich from New, New Mexico is the lead Democratic sponsor. He's came in with my class. We, we are, you know, we talk to each other quite a bit. And Tim Scott uh, is the Republican lead from South Carolina. They're doing what's called Noah's Ark, where they, they add co-sponsors, you know, Republican and Democrat, um, so because they don't want to make it sort of look like too much of a partisan bill. They're, they were up to 42, so 21 and 21 uh, the last time I looked. And uh, and I know the coalition that has been built around this thing is, is you know, hitting the Senate hard. Um, you know, that's, that's frankly about as much as I know. Lastly, and I realize I'm, I'm talking too long here, but when CBO scored this, if you read their their score, there was nothing in there about uh, bending the cost curve or, you know, helping the public finances of the country by by reduced health care spending. It was all about collection of tax revenue. And again, their their calculation in the first three or four years was very minor. It was um, zero in 21, zero in 22, six in 23, and 14 in 24. So the, the total net budget impact in the first four years is about $20 billion. In the out years, they, they calculate a much bigger number based on what they call wage effect, which is that as employers depress the cost of their, their plans to avoid the tax, that there will be a wage effect in terms of higher wages and salaries that people will pay. That will be taxed, and the federal government will get the, the, the windfall in terms of tax revenue. That is a very controversial theory. Uh, you know, I can just tell you that there are, um, you know, 
Mercer, or some of the other big uh, economic, they challenge whether or not there's really a dollar for dollar trade off in terms of a wage inf- in effect. Some companies will just put the money in their pocket, uh, you know, and, and their shareholders will benefit from it. And um, so, I, you know, again, it was not your sort of um, normal CBO score in terms of tax revenue. And, and frankly, I think that was one of the reasons why, you know, people really, um, in an extraordinary way, you know, came together to support this in huge numbers on both sides of the aisle. 